Welcome to the TCT AP 2020 virtual meeting. My name is D.Y. Kang from Asan Medical Center. Over the 40 years, the PCI dramatically evolved with the progression of stents, devices, and drugs. Current advances allowed it patients with a severe coronary disease with high procedural and bleeding risk to benefit safely from revascularization procedures that might not have been offered in the past. However, dedicated skills and knowledge is needed to select and treat these complex, higher risk and indicated patients safely. Two moderators, Dr. Robert Byrne from Mata Private Hospital in Ireland and Dr. Ajay Kartane from Columbia University Medical Center will share their secrets about the cheap and hybrid risk patients with four distinguished speakers. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Robert Byrne. I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, working in uh, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, I'm delighted to be co-moderating this uh, session with Ajay Kirtane from Columbia University uh, Medical Center in the USA. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity uh, to moderate this session, which is called Highlight Session 6, chip lesions or HBOR patients. So we have some great speakers and some great discussants, and I'd like to introduce you to, those, to, to them now. Uh, in terms of uh, discussants, uh, we'll be joined uh, presently by Davida uh, Capadano from Italy. We also are very pleased to welcome Roxana uh, Mehran from uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, we have Duk Wu Park uh, from uh, Korea, and we have uh, Bobby Ye from, uh, from the USA. We have a great program in terms of uh, topics and speakers, and uh, the initial uh, talk will be given by uh, James uh, uh, Flaherty, and his topic is complex PCI in the area of ischemia. Uh, uh, in the era of the ischemia trial, the interventionist perspective. We'll have a follow-on then from Antonio Colombo talking on uh, atherectomy, experts' choice, rotor versus orbital versus laser versus lithotripsy, and then Stefan Windecker will give us some uh, in insights into the Onyx uh, one trial and the uh, choice of stent platforms in HBR patients. And then uh, last, but by no means least, Philip Urban uh, will give us uh, an update on the work of the ARC HBR group looking at definitions and the optimal antithrombotic and PCI strategies in HBR patients. Uh, the questions and discussion we'll keep until the end of the session. So with that introduction, I'll uh, thank you for joining uh, today and hand over to my co-moderator, Dr. Curtinay, to introduce the first speaker. Thanks so much, Robert. I'm very much excited for this session, which has phenomenal speakers and great topics, which you've gone through. And uh, with that, we'll start with uh, James Flaherty, who's gonna talk to us about complex PCI in the era of the ischemia trial, the interventionalist perspective. James, thanks so much. So I'm gonna talk about the implications of the ischemia trial on PCI. I have nothing to disclose. Here are the three seminal papers that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in April of this year, the Bain ischemia trial, the quality of life analysis, and a parallel trial on those with advanced kidney disease. In the main trial, there were about 5,000 patients that had at least moderate ischemia on a stress test. Most of them then got coronary CTA to define their anatomy. And then they were randomized to an initial invasive or an initial conservative strategy. The primary outcome was cardiovascular death, MI, unstable angina, heart failure, or cardiac arrest. It's important to understand the exclusions so as not to apply this trial to them. Advanced renal failure, recent ACS, unprotected left main, low EF, heart failure, or refractory angina. And after patients were randomized, within 30 days, they were to get rebask as complete as possible as determined by the local heart team, PCI versus cabbage. 26,000 stress tests were screened. About a third of them were then further screened to be determined to be eligible. 5,000 were randomized. So about 20% of those screened got to randomization. What did the patients look like? 64 years old, 77% male, two thirds white, 40% diabetic, very little previous revask. Reserved EF with very little heart failure. 
So it looked like much like our many of our trials in, in uh, cardiovascular medicine. In the invasive group, most got angiography. 79% underwent rebask. It was invasive, but it didn't mandate rebask. Here's a breakdown in as treated. Two, th three, th quarter, three quarters got PCI and a quarter got cabbage. In the conservative group, 21% crossed over during the follow-up to get uh, revascularization. This is what we know so far about the angiographic characteristics. About 71% had multivessel disease. About a little more than a third had significant proxy LED disease. FFR was used 20% or so of the time to quantify indeterminate lesions. This is what we know about the revask. Again, three quarters got PCI of those revasks. Most got second generation drug loading stents. Kind of a high rate of stent not deliverability at 5%. Very high rate of internal mammary use for those that got cabbage. This is not a PCI versus cabbage trial, so it shouldn't be confused with that. And there's still more details that we don't know about, things like completeness of revasks, CTOs, as treated. So that will follow, but unfortunately that will only be hypothesis generated. How does this compare to the current trial from 2007, which was an angiography driven revask trial with PCI? Well, in the ischemia trial, there's higher burden of ischemia. Most patients were randomized before angiography, very high drug loading stent, use some FFR, cabbage was an option. But like the like the Kurtz trial, there was a low burden of symptoms, predominantly preserved LVEF without heart failure, and there was about 20 to 30% crossover. How did patients feel? The trial, at least the quality of life analysis, relied on the Seattle angina questionnaire. If you look at the panel here, the higher the score, the less angina you have. Patients scored on average about an 80, which is you know mild angina. And a, about a third of them had no recent angina. So the primary result at six months, the composite outcome that we talked about, slightly but not significantly favored the conservative strategy. And at five years, the curves crossed over, not significantly, to favor the initial invasive strategy. All-cause death was almost virtually identical. Here it is graphically, we see a slight advantage of the conservative strategy trend, and then the trend reverses with probably more spontaneous MIs and more unstable angina in the conservative group that represented the separation of these curves between years two and three. What about myocardial infarction? There was some controversy about this based on the primary or secondary definition. The primary definition was more in, in line with prognostic importance, and that was the one used in the primary analysis. There are more procedural MIs naturally in the invasive. Those were counterbalanced by more spontaneous MIs in the conservative group over the follow-up time. Here it is graphically, much like the primary results, early separation favoring conservative, and then later more spontaneous MIs in the conservative group. How does this compare to FAME2? Well, FAME2 was a FFR-driven PCI revascination trial Here's the five-year data that were published a few years ago. The curves are similar, although the effect size and the significance is greater for the FAME2 trial. Now, again, all lesions treated in the FAME2 trial were deemed to be ischemic by FFR. Not exactly true of the ischemia trial. What about angina? We talked about that these patients weren't severely symptomatic. Nevertheless, in the invasive group, there was significant and sustained relief of angina over time. And here it is a different way that shows that the lower the score, which means more angina, the greater angina relief, and it was sustained over the follow-up of the trial. So for upfront rebask on the invasive side, certainly decreased angina at a cost of increased procedural MIs. On the conservative trial, on the conservative side, definitely less procedures, including less angiography, at a cost of more late spontaneous MIs. There's lots of debates about What's the significance of the MI, procedural versus spontaneous? We're not going to settle this in this uh, brief lecture, but essentially they were balanced. Where does this leave us? Maybe it leaves us in a place we talk about a lot these days and shared decision making and talking to patients, giving them the pros and cons of going forward with an invasive strategy early or waiting 
and a lot of this is going to be dependent on symptoms. How is this going to impact the use of PCI? We saw after the COURAGE trial, as illustrated here, this, this group that looked at when COURAGE came out in 2007, PCI for things like ACS didn't really change, but there was a drop off. Now there were other things going on at this time too. There was scare about stem thrombosis with new juggling stents. But uh, those that remember this era can recall a definite drop off, at least for a few years in the use of PCI. Some of this was related to sensationalism, a lot of, a lot of media response to the trial and such. Here's a meta-analysis looking at 14 randomized trial, including the ischemias, which represent a little more than a third, looking at invasive versus conservative by Bangalore and colleagues. And essentially, we see the same story across eras. No change in death, increased procedural MIs at, at a cost of more spontaneous MIs in the conservative group, less unstable angina, and better anginal relief with an invasive strategy. What about guidelines? The U.S. guidelines 2012 gave a class one for cabbage to improve survival with severe free vessel disease and improve PCI or cabbage to improve symptoms, a class 2A to improve survival with extensive ischemia or improve symptoms when medical therapy was not possible. The European guidelines 2008, class one for cabbage or PCI to improve prognosis or cabbage or PCI to improve symptoms, the choice dependent on other factors. In the US, we also have what's known as appropriate use criteria that grades us on whether a procedure is appropriate or not. And essentially, when there's moderate to severe ischemia, even without symptoms or even those that aren't fully optimized in medication, generally these guidelines allow us to do revascularization based on the presence of moderate to severe ischemia alone. You'll have to wonder when new guidelines come out if all of these that rely on prognosis and survival will be rejudged. Uh, in light of this new important information, a lot of these guidelines are based on trials that occurred 30 or, or more years ago and may not be relevant in the current era of optimal medical therapy. So in conclusion, in stable ischemic heart disease with moderate to severe ischemia, upfront revestation does not improve survival. Coronary CTA has emerged a validated modality in the assessment of stable ischemic heart disease, and it may display some stress testing and diagnostic angiography. Upfront revascularization in stable ischemic heart disease may cause procedural MI, and that may be later be balanced by less spontaneous MIs. And probably the strongest conclusion is that early revascularization in stable ischemic heart disease provides durable relief from angina. So at the end, uh, what do we learn? Well, we should be treating the patient and not the stress test. Thank you for your attention. Um, we're going to move on to the next talk right now, which is gonna be presented by Antonio Colombo, who is truly an atherectomy expert. And so the talk is aptly named as atherectomy expert's choice, rota versus orbital versus laser versus lithotripsy. Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me uh, in this very interesting meeting. Uh, so I took the liberty to change a little bit the title and uh, calling technique for optimal lesion preparation, which is basically summarizes uh, uh, all the available uh, techniques. I have no conflict to disclose. Uh, so I would say that the approach to calcified lesions goes first with high pressure balloon, more simple, then rotablator orbital atherectomy, uh, angioscout or cutting balloon, uh, shock wave, and uh, for people who have it, uh, laser is a possibility. High pressure balloon is the most simple. Uh, you go from the traditional high pressure to the super high pressure balloon, then it goes up to 40 atmosphere. There are some advantages, it's uh, not very expensive, easy. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's not free of uh, complications because uh, in this case, uh, we have a successful result of an instant restenosis, uh, which uh, uh, goes from uh, 3.6 uh, to 7, but uh, you may have a vessel rupture even if you size the balloon correctly, because uh, uh, the uh, weak part of the vessel may give up, uh, and so it's not uh, such a 100% safe uh, approach. Uh, 
uh, rotablation and cutting balloon, I put them together because not necessarily one is uh, sufficient. Here is a calcified lesion treated uh, uh, successfully with a, a 175 burr. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, subsequent uh, high pressure balloon uh, inflation uh, is not uh, complete and uh, the operator has to uh, go to uh, cutting balloon. Uh, here you see the uh, uh, ibus with the circumferential calcium partially broken but not, uh, uh, but not completely and only uh, cutting balloon at high pressure at uh, 20 atmosphere uh, is able uh, to fully release uh, the lesion. Uh, this cutting balloon was even inflated at 26 atmosphere. Uh, and uh, now you see that uh, uh, the calcium is uh, sufficiently broken, uh, is not removed, of course, but sufficiently broken uh, to allow uh, good, uh, good expansion. Uh, this uh, is another example of, uh, uh, of an atherectomy technique. This is a lesion with an FFR of 0.75. Uh, OCT shows uh, uh, very eccentric uh, lumen with uh, calcium uh, between uh, uh, 12 and 6 o'clock. Uh, we treated uh, with uh, uh, four uh, passes of uh, uh, orbital atherectomy. In a vessel like this, you can uh, uh, modify the size of your burr by changing uh, the speed, basically increasing the speed. Uh, after multiple uh, passes, uh, six, uh, six passes, you see some improvement, but really not, uh, uh, not as, uh, as uh, you would expect, because you see still uh, a lot of calcium between 12 and 6 o'clock. Uh, then we used the high pressure uh, cutting balloon and finally a drug coated balloon with no, with no stenting. The point I make here is that uh, sometimes one technique is not sufficient. You have to combine uh, different techniques. Here is a follow up angio at uh, six months. This is the post and this is the six months follow up. Again, uh, no stenting usage. Uh, why we like the cutting balloon sometimes uh, even over the uh, high pressure balloon because uh, we believe that dilating force with the cutting balloon is more uniform. The high pressure balloon uh, deforms in the area where the vessel gives up. Uh, the cutting balloon with the uh, blades uh, stays uh, uninflated unless uh, the blade uh, is in contact. Uh, so the blade keeps a kind of uniformity of the balloon inflation. Uh, use of laser uh, in our experience is uh, quite limited, uh, is only utilized in a situation of stent under expansion. Here you see an instant restenosis with uh, uh, insufficient stent expansion. Balloon, uh, even high pressure, 28 atmosphere does not give up. So at this point, we use a laser, 77 fluency and energy uh, maximum. And uh, uh, we usually do uh, one pass uh, without contrast. And if we are not successful, uh, we inject contrast while activating uh, the laser. Uh, it's very important uh, to stay inside the stent because if you inject contrast outside the stent, uh, you create uh, dissection. And here you see an optimal stent expansion uh, supported by IVUS imaging, uh, which is uh, quite evident. Uh, shockwave balloon is uh, the newcomer. Uh, it's, uh, it's very safe, uh, really, basically, we have uh, use this device quite quite a lot and so far did not encounter the complications. You see a, a very calcified diffuse LED lesion. Uh, baseline uh, OCT shows a, a lot of calcium uh, throughout uh, the area. Here you see the uh, steel frames of the diffusely calcified LED. 
So uh, lesion preparation, sometimes you may have to use a, a balloon uh, to make the lumen large enough to deliver the shockwave balloon. And here, uh, several passes, you can, uh, with one cast, uh, you can give eight sessions. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, two balloons utilized after shockwave. You see there is a small dissection. Uh, the lesion is, uh, is well expanded. Uh, it's not rare to use the high pressure balloon after the shockwave. Uh, if you need. In this uh, case, uh, we did uh, use uh, additional high pressure, 24 atmosphere, and then uh, uh, appropriate uh, uh, expansion, like we almost a stand-like result, but uh, even uh, uh, with a stand-like result, we elected to implant the stent, uh, and you see real optimal stent expansion. I believe this technology is very safe, and uh, is uh, almost uh, totally free from slow flow, uh, which is uh, a not rare complication of the technique I just discussed before. This is the OCT image with uh, excellent stent expansion. Please notice the circularity of the stent, uh, which is uh, not always uh, common in these calcified lesions. And I believe the circularity improves the flow, giving laminar flow. Uh, here is an example of an occluded uh, stent uh, with a subintimal passage, uh, which is uh, uh, not uh, common, but sometimes is the only way to go through. You see an extensive dissection, all subintimal. And uh, uh, despite being subintimal, uh, we performed a shock wave. Uh, because we believe that uh, is, uh, is uh, safe, uh, sometimes even safer than a high pressure balloon. And uh, this is an optimal expansion uh, with a subintimal track, uh, which becomes intraluminal only distal. Uh, this is the IBUS images with uh, optimal expansion. So uh, to summarize, optimal lesion preparation means uh, a rotablator, laser with contrast injection, uh, we only utilize for under-expanded stent, cutting or angioscarped at very high pressure, uh, over 20, OPN or high pressure, very high pressure balloon, again, uh, be concerned and use only with IVUS guidance because the risk of vessel rupture is not negligible. Uh, shockwave balloon is a newcomer and uh, uh, in the group of uh, uh, plaque removal or uh, uh, calcium removal orbital aterectomy, which uh, is also effective in uh, uh, fibrotic lesion and not only in calcific lesion. Thank you for your attention. Uh, overview and uh, only you has all the experience with all of these can can synthesize it in that manner. So that was really, really helpful. I think we're going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about HBR patients. And the first of two talks is going to be given by Stefan Windecker, who needs no introduction and is going to speak to us about choice of stent platforms in these patients with specific insights from the Onyx One trial. Thank you, uh, RJ, for the opportunity to discuss uh, the stent choice in uh, HBR uh, patients. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. It goes uh, to the credit of the ARC HBR consortium that they provided uh, criteria, major and minor, for high bleeding risk. And importantly, also by consensus agreed on a threshold as to what constitutes high bleeding risk, namely embark three or five bleeding of more than 4% at one year or a risk of intracranial hemorrhage of more than 1% at one year. During the past uh, decade, it has been increasingly recognized uh, that the prognostic impact of major bleeding rivals that of uh, bleeding. Here you see as an example two uh, publications where uh, the risk increase of myocardial infarction is rather similar to uh, the risk increase associated with, uh, for example, BARC-3 bleeding in the TRACER trial. 
Now, if you look at the frequency of uh, HBR criteria, I just list one uh, publication where you see that the prevalence is about 30 to 40 percent in uh, routine uh, clinical uh, practice. And importantly, the vast majority of patients that have high ble bleeding risk criteria also have complex PCI criteria. And in that context, it is important to think about the relative risk and benefit from prolonged versus short dual antiplatelet therapy, where in this analysis stratified by bleeding risk as assessed by the precise depth uh, score of less than 25, there was more benefit of um, prolonged DAPT in patients with complex uh, PCI. Conversely, in patients that were judged at high bleeding risk, there was no benefit of long DAPT, and that was irrespective of PCI complexity. Now, again, the credit goes uh, to Philip Urban and the leaders' free trial uh, investigators that for the first time in high bleeding risk uh, patients did a dedicated randomized trial comparing a polymer-free drug-eluting stent versus a bare metal stent in patients that were treated with one-month DAPT. And here you see the two-year outcomes, which confirmed the primary outcome published in the New England Journal, where basically the primary endpoint and composite of cardiac death, MI, or stent thrombosis, was significantly in favor of the polymer-free drug-eluting stent versus bare metal stent. And it's, interestingly, there was not only benefit in terms of efficacy, but also in terms of the risk of any myocardial infarction. However, it is important to note that uh, current routine clinical practice routinely uses new generation drug eluting stents. And if you look at the synthesis of all available data as compiled in this individual patient data meta-analysis, comparing bare metal stents with drug eluting stents, we also know that the risk of cardiac death or MI is actually in favor of drug eluting stents with no significant differences or at least borderline for cardiac death, but certainly in significant difference as it relates to myocardial infarction. And in the 2018 Myocardial Revascularization Guideline of the European Society of Cardiology, drug eluting stents are uh, listed as default device, irrespective of concomitant anticoagulant therapy and the anticipated duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. And therefore, in this context, we are fortunate that there are several completed or ongoing dedicated trials in HBR populations that investigate new generation drug eluting stents, and I will highlight a few of them. The first one is the senior trial that investigated in patients more than 75 years of age the Synergy stent with bare metal stents treated for one month uh, DAPT in CCS patients and six months in patients with acute coronary syndromes. And in this trial, the Synergy eluting stent was superior from composite of all cause death, MI, stroke, and target lesion revascularization as compared to bare metal stent. More recently, RJ uh, presented the Evolve uh, Short Adapt a trial at TCT and study that is submitted for publication at this point in time. And it looked at patients that were treated for three months the APT and 1,500 patients that were event-free and then followed between three and 15 months. And what you observe is that the composite of death and MI amounted to 5.8% and an incidence of BARG 2 to 5 bleeding of 7.1%. Importantly, in a pre-specified analysis in a propensity uh, matched comparison, the risk was similar for on control that was treated for with 12 months uh, DAPT. And this pre-specified analysis fulfilled criteria for non-inferiority. At the same uh, meeting, uh, we presented uh, the ONIX-1 trial, which was uh, the first uh, randomized trial comparing a new generation drug eluting stent, the Resolute ONIX, with the BioFreedom polymer-free drug eluting stents. Patients had to have at least one high bleeding risk criterion. And they were routinely treated with one month DAPT. The study had one primary safety endpoint, which was cardiac death, myocardial infarction, or stent thrombosis at one year. And there was a secondary powered efficacy endpoint of target lesion uh, failure. This was truly a global study with 84 participating sites and a very strong contribution also from Asia uh, Pacific. Uh, 
And here you see uh, the uh, distribution of high bleeding risk uh, criteria. First, there was a mean of 1.6 uh, high bleeding risk criteria. Nearly 50% of patients had two high bleeding risk criteria. And the leading reasons were age and the presence of oral anticoagulation. These were elderly patients with mean age of 74 and high prevalence of diabetes and acute coronary syndromes were present in more than 50%. Of note, if you look at the procedure characteristics, then the crossover during the study was more pronounced in the biofreedom arm as compared to the resolute onyx. And if you look at the QCA core lab evaluation, then the device, the device success, which was significantly in favor of the resolute onyx, translated also in improved post-procedural angiographic uh, outcomes. Now here you see the antithrombotic therapy transition after PCI, where 92% adhere to dual, dual antiplatelet therapy during the first month, then in the majority of cases discontinued and single antiplatelet therapy was maintained throughout one year follow-up in 88% of patients with a roughly equal distribution between P212 inhibitors and aspirin. Now, this is the primary safety endpoint for cardiac death, MI, and stent thrombosis, showing an event rate of 16.9% versus 17.1% for the resolute known onyx, with an absolute difference of 0.2%, fulfilling the pre-specified criteria of non-inferiority. And here we see the cumulative event rates for the primary endpoint, as well as the uh, components of the primary endpoints, where we see no significant uh, differences for any of uh, the individual uh, components. Now, interestingly, for myocardial infarction, there were similar and high rates related to the ascertainment in terms of periprocedural myocardial infarction. But looking at spontaneous myocardial infarction, there was actually a significant difference in favor of the resolute onyx arm. And if you look at stent thrombosis, there were no statistically significant differences, but numerically the incidence was lower with the resolute onyx stent uh, platform. Finally, if you look at landmark analysis set at 30 days, the time point where the majority of patients transitioned to a single antiplatelet therapy, we see no differences up to 30 days, but again, a uh, lower incidence of spontaneous myocardial infarction in favor of the resolute onyx stand platform. Finally, if you look at the powered secondary efficacy endpoint of target lesion failure, you see no significant differences between the two stand platforms throughout the one year. So in summary, ONIX-1 is actually the first trial that compared a new generation drug eluting stand versus a polymer-free drug-coated stand with some systematic use of one month DAPT in patients at high bleeding risk and complex uh, patient and lesion characteristics. Among these uh, HBR patients treated with one month DAPT, the uh, resolute onyx was as safe and effective as the biofreedom stent, and it was associated with improved angiographic outcomes and uh, improved device success after PCI. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Stefan, for that great overview. And I think to conclude this session didactic talks, we're going to now have Philip Urban, who's going to talk to us about specifically the definition and optimal antithrombotic and PCI strategies in HBR patients with an updated consensus from the ARC HBR group, perfectly bookending Stefan, your talk. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm really proud and happy to be part of this group and discuss these different interesting topics. And indeed, I'll try and give you an update on the consensus of the ARC HBR group. My title focused on optimal antithrombotic treatment. I think that may be left for the discussion. We'll see how that goes. These are my conflicts. As uh, Stefan mentioned rapidly, there are a lot of trials of HBR patients currently. Uh, but it's interesting to note that each of us went for his best guess of who these patients might be. And as you can see here, the criteria that qualify a patient as being at increased bleeding risk actually vary quite a bit from trial to trial. And so that situation brought us to uh, envisage the ARC HBR initiative. And uh, um, we did that in compliance with the ARC charter. It was organized by a CRO that I'm happy to work with, CERC in Europe. It's a non-profit effort. It was sponsored by 22 pharma and device companies. 
and we put together a group of 31 experts from Europe, US, Japan, and South Korea. And for that first phase, we had two meetings in 2018 with the aim of developing a consensus definition of who HBR patients might be. And as has already been mentioned, we came up with the notion that an HBR patient would be a patient with a bleeding risk, mark three or five, of 4% or more at one year, and or a risk of intracranial hemorrhage of greater than 1% at one year. And then it followed that a major criterion would be one which in isolation would confer that level of risk, and a minor criterion would be one that would increase the bleeding risk, but we felt not to that degree. And then because we had to remain pragmatic uh, at this stage, we decided that a patient would be considered HBR if he satisfied one major criterion or at least two minor criteria. And this is rather a busy slide, but I'll try and take you through it rapidly. Uh, age was considered a minor criteria on its own. Renal function was a minor or a major, depending on the level of dysfunction. Cirrhosis with portal hypertension, a major. Active cancer, a major. Um, moderate anemia, according to WHO, major. Less severe anemia, a minor. Low platelet counts below 100,000 would be major. A number of serious CNS problems were considered major. And then other less severe or older ischemic strokes would be minor. A bleeding diathesis with clinical consequences, major. Recent severe bleeding requiring transfusion or recurrent bleeding uh, at any time would be major. If it was between six and 12 and it was a single, six and 12 months and it was a single event, it would be minor. Oral anticoagulants at any time, long-term after PCI, major. Use of steroids or non-steroids anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, minor. And then planned surgery on the APT, recent major trauma or surgery, a major. For those who are interested, uh, this has been written up in detail uh, and published uh, last year in the European Heart Journal and its circulation. It's uh, free for access. And in terms of clinical use for those who wish to do so, it can be downloaded as an app and then it generates a report. The next phase, which is still ongoing of the ARC-HBR group, has been an effort led by uh, Davide Capodanno, who I hope has joined by now, um, focusing on design principles for clinical trials in patients at high bleeding risk. Um, and basically, obviously, don't have time to go through all this in detail, but the group felt that the endpoints would have to be different according to whether it was a device or a drug trial, which is true for non-HBR patients as well. Um, and also, importantly, I think that there would be always a focus on the ischemic thrombotic side of things and the bleeding endpoint. And probably not often useful to put them all together since they tend to go in different directions, especially for drug trials. This has been accepted for publication, but I don't think it's yet available. So obviously the next question is, uh, can we validate these consensus criteria? And I chose uh, also a paper from Bern, uh, from uh, Stefan Windecker's group, where they looked at their registry, 12,000 patients. Bleeding was defined as BARC 3 or 5, ischemia as cardiac death, target vessel MI, and target lesion revascularization. And there was a follow-up for one year. The first piece of information that I thought really interesting was that the number of patients in this large registry who satisfied at least one major, two minor criteria was 39%. So it's over a third of their PCI volume is made up of HBR patients. Does it actually make a difference if you're HBR or not? Well, for bleeding, it does something since your risk of bleeding is tripled relative to non-ARC HBR patients. And then if you look at cardiac death, MI and TLR, it doubles your risk. So both sides of the equation go up, but more so for bleeding. And looking at other series that are relatively similar, um, David de Cao with uh, Roxana Miran in the US, 44% of their patients in a registry were HBR. And Natsuaki, uh, the Kyoto registry in Japan, 43% of their patients were HBR. 
So it's a larger group that I honestly had anticipated a few years ago. And together with Roxana Colloran from uh, Dublin, we looked at those three trials in terms of the hazard ratio. And you can see that it's very consistent. The risk of bleeding if you're an HBR patient is increased by a factor three or little more. And your risk of having a thrombotic ischemic endpoint is more or less doubled. So we're back to this problem of the trade-off of thrombosis and bleeding. And we know the criteria that predict bleeding, HBR, and we've gone through them two minutes ago. We can also make a list of those parameters that predict patients to be HTR, high thrombotic risk. And they would be acute coronary syndrome, diabetes, a history of prior MI, a complex PCI procedure, a history of prior stent thrombosis, renal failure, and so on. To look at this, together with Stuart Pocock and John Gregson at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, we were, uh, and together with a number of generous investigators, we put together a group of 12,000 plus patients who had been enrolled in six angioplasty studies and focused on something like half of them who satisfied the ARC HBR criteria. We didn't want to look at periprocedural events. And, but once we got rid of those, we identified independent predictors of the bleeding events and of MI or ST using Cox proportional hazard modeling. We could gen generate a scatter plot. I'll show you that in a minute for individual risks for individual patients of their balance of bleeding and MI ST risks. And then we could modulate that with the associated mortality. And thanks to Stefan and uh, Medtronic, we were able to validate the model using 1,400 patients who satisfied ARC-HBR criteria and who had been enrolled in ONIX-1. These are the trials we used, the leaders, seniors, Joyce, Paris, and Century 2, and clearly the percentage of patients who satisfied our adapted ARC criteria varied quite a bit from trial to trial, as expected. If we look at the one-year event rates, the ARC-HBR patients had a more than four times increased bleeding risk relate, relative to non-ARC HBR patients. And they had, again, a roughly doubled risk of a thrombotic MIST complication. And the rest of my talk will finish on those 6,641 patients. If we now look at the criteria that were used for those patients to label them as um, ARC HBR, we see, again, the usual story the most frequently used were age, renal insufficiency, anemia, and need for oral anticoagulants. Busy slide, I apologize, but this is really where the crux of the story comes from. If we look at predictors for BARC 3 and 5, there were four that were uniquely associated with bleeding. Oral anticoagulants, a combined um, situation of liver disease, cancer, or planned major surgery, age above 65, and chronic obstructive lung disease. Then there were four predictors that only predicted MI and ST. Those were a history of prior MI, a presentation of STEMI non-STEMI, diabetes, and use of a bare metal stent. And then there were four predictors that actually predicted both. Um, low hemoglobin, poor renal function, smoking, and a complex PCI procedure. But if you look at the hazard ratio, for instance, for uh, moderate um, anemia below 110 grams per liter, you see that the hazard ratio is nearly four for bleeding. It's only 1.5 for MISD. So it's relatively complex. The C statistics were acceptable, 0 0.68, 0 0.69. And then using the patients from Onyx 1, the C statistic was 0 0.74 for bleeding, and it was also 0 0.74 for MISD. This is a scatter plot, and each of these dots represent one of the 6,600 patients. And you can see that they're spread out quite widely in terms of their relative risks of bleeding uh, and thrombosis. And the dotted line would be the line along which the risk of both events is similar. It gets more complicated because you can then also calculate it, um, the excess mortality associated either with MIST or with BARC 3 and 5 shown there, and the ratio of that excess risk of mortality was 1.9. So with our data, the risk of dying after MIST was nearly twice as high 
is dying after BARC 3.5. So you can put in another line into that scatter plot, uh, which would be the mortality weighted equal trade off. Just show you two patients, both of which are um, ARC HBR. Patient one, 56 year old lady with diabetes. She smokes. She's presents with non-STEMI. She's already had a heart attack two years ago. She's on ibuprofen. Hemoglobin is reasonable. Renal function is poor. She gets four drug eluting stents and she's discharged on ticagrelor and aspirin. You can see that her uh, risk of bleeding is only about 4%. Her risk of MIST is in excess of 20%. She's very different from patient number two, who's also ARC-HBR, 79-year-old man with AF on oral anticoagulants. He presents with grade three angina. He used to smoke, but he has some damage to his lungs. He's had hemicolectomy for cancer six months ago. He's severely anemic, 105 grams per liter. His renal function is okay. He gets a single drug eluting stent with proximal LED. He's discharged on clopidogrel and oral anticoagulants. His bleeding risk is in the 30% range. His MIST risk is less than 2.5. So in conclusion, patients at increased risk of bleeding have received considerable attention over the past few years. The ARC-HBR consensus-based criteria were designed to define this population and allow consistent and comparable trial results. They've been validated in several series for the moment, Japan, Europe, and the US. Using 12 easily available predictors, the respective risks of bleeding and MIST can be estimated and then further modulated by the associated mortality risk for individual HBR patient. And obviously, this is a first step um, towards a tool which we hope may help us better tailor anti-thrombotic therapy. Thank you. So thanks very much, uh, uh, Philip, for a great uh, presentation. And I'd uh, just like to take this opportunity to thank all of the presenters for very uh, concise uh, overviews of the complex topics that were uh, chosen. So we have a little bit of time left uh, for discussion. So I'd like to moderate this discussion together with uh, Ajay. And uh, uh, perhaps we'll start uh, with with James. And uh, James uh, summed up uh, his interpretation of the ischemia trial. And perhaps, James, I'd like to ask you if you could uh, tell us in concrete uh, terms what you've taken from the trial in terms of things that change uh, your your practice. I think you mentioned towards the end of your uh, presentation uh, uh, some some insights on that. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it, when you think about how it may change your practice, it depends on how your practice was to begin with. Um, but in general, I think what I take from this trial is uh, PCI for ischemia is is best applied for those with symptoms. And it's very effective uh, and it's generally safe, but there are risks, um, particularly procedural MIs, and there may be some balance later with spontaneous MIs. So I think, I think it's important to have conversations with patients and referring physicians uh, in this population on, on what PCI may accomplish. And I think there's some old myths that, that just uh, a blanket treatment of revascularization for ischemia is somehow protecting life. And I think this trial showed powerfully that probably not true, at least to the follow-up that was done. David, I might maybe uh, uh, just ask you to come in there. What about your practice uh, after ischemia? Are you doing things any differently? What about the gatekeeper function of uh, CT? Are these uh, changes that you're already uh, taking into your practice? No, I would not say, Robert, that the shift has happened uh, so far because we have CT availability, but basically uh, the diagnosis is mostly oriented in the cath lab still. So I think there is a kind of clinical inertia that will uh, last some time before we can really shift the paradigm, let's say. What uh, it changes in my practice, of course, is that I try to be uh, more conservative in terms of uh, not proposing uh, PCI to patients if I'm not sure they are on uh, optimized medical therapy. And I try to be uh, also a bit more conservative when I do PCI, trying to avoid as much as I can periprocedural MI, uh, trying to put less stents uh, somehow and, uh, and see what happened in the post-procedural period. So I think that the way we can maximize the benefit of the therapy that we uh, give to our patient is to reduce periprocedural MI for the sake of having a, an advantage in terms of quality of life and reduction of spontaneous myocardial infarction.
I think those are great uh, answers. And at least for me, the one, uh, one aspect too that's important is remember the follow-up is a median of 3.2 years for a age population that's going to live quite a bit longer than that. And so the importance of long-term follow-up is really critical. The fact that patients were screened out potentially with prognostically important disease with the CT is also important. And then I think the big, just from a clinical trial standpoint, and maybe it'd be interesting to hear Bobby's thoughts on this, is the issue of the patients who are in the invasive arm who didn't get the therapy. And then even the therapy that was given was mixed combined with a crossover. Do we really feel confident with a three, you know, sort of 60 year old with bad multivessel disease that surgical revascularization is not going to offer them any prognostic benefit out to a 10 year period with the data we have now? So maybe Bobby, I'll pose that to you. Sure. Thanks, Anja. You know, I think that they, they did pre present the subgroup analysis based on the extent of multivessel disease versus single vessel disease, and there did not look to be um, an interaction there. So it did look like even with more extensive disease, uh, by, at least by CT, that, that the effect for the primary endpoint was the same. But I, you know, I understand, you know, if you, I think Davide has said this well before, which this is really a, a, a strategy trial and shouldn't be viewed as a therapeutic trial. But if one is to try to infer therapeutic benefit from it, then you have to take into account the idea that there was quote unquote crossover in, in, when viewed in light of, of that sort of comparison. In that case, with 40% or so, or 35 plus percent of patients not getting the assigned uh, revascularization that they would have been otherwise been assigned, you have to, to sort of take those numbers into account and realize that that will bias the results to the null. So this, the finding that there is still a difference in late spontaneous MI is sort of even more impressive in that and I think was surprising. I think we're going to see find out more as we go on. For me, the trial didn't change necessarily my approach from a therapeutic standpoint, but it did change my approach from a diagnostic standpoint. This is where I think that practice might change the most. From a therapeutic standpoint, it does give us, I think, a little bit more confidence to counsel our patients that they have ischemia, but are very mildly symptomatic, that they are safe. Even though I think we all probably believe that beforehand, patients can themselves be nervous about it. So it did, I think, provide more information to reassure patients. Antonio, you gave us a masterclass there in lesion uh, preparation and uh, showed some really nice examples from intravascular imaging of the different types of uh, calcium modification with the different modalities that are now in our toolbox. One of the things I was struck by was how you uh, combine good lesion preparation with drug-coated balloon-only angioplasty. And maybe uh, you might let us know uh, what your overall impression of this uh, strategy is and if it's something that you frequently use. But uh, thank you uh, for this question. I think uh, uh, we have to go back uh, to the uh, reason why stents uh, were uh, put into practice. Stents uh, were mainly uh, in, in, in our practice to prevent uh, vessel occlusion from uh, dissection. And not necessarily to prevent risk stenosis. As a matter of fact, uh, we still have low risk stenosis, but we still fail uh, with the uh, high number of revascularization compared to cabbage. So we needed to develop uh, ways uh, to lower risk stenosis. Uh, and uh, I'm not so sure if taking the ways the stent uh, and using only drug coated balloon is the answer, but at least. Uh, I believe uh, we have to explore this venue because uh, I believe that with the stent uh, we have done the most. And I am concerned about using a very long stents. Uh, stents were made for short focal lesions. And uh, I believe when we go to 38 uh, millimeter stenting, uh, we change the flow dynamics and we uh, impair uh, into uh, endothelization and uh, we foster uh, tissue growth. So I, I think uh, I'm not giving you the answer, but uh, I say that we have to explore new values. Okay, thanks, Antonio. Doku, I wonder if you're, uh, we saw some really nice uh, intravascular imaging examples there from Antonio. Do you think uh, this is integral to the choice of device? We now have a wide spectrum of tools for uh, plaque and calcium modification. And uh, how do you see the role of intravascular imaging? Can the pattern of the calcium then guide which of these tools you take from your toolbox? Uh, 
Yeah, definitely. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, intravascular ultrasound, I think uh, uh, one of the essential tool for uh, region preparation, although, you know, so angiographically looks uh, uh, mild or moderate, sometimes uh, if you want to do uh, intravascular ultrasound, there is some circular calcium at the time, we can change our strategy. So, and I think, uh, you know, some uh, uh, most of uh, consensus document and uh, expert uh, document recommend uh, uh, intravascular modality to uh, treat the, uh, the very severe calcified region. I definitely uh, agree the intravascular ultrasound is essential to evaluate the status of calcium and also to guide uh, uh, optimal region preparation guidance like orbital atherectomy, rotabulation, and something like that. I think that that's a really good take home point and we're seeing more adoption or at least more willingness to think about adopting more intravascular imaging. And it's a great way to transition to this topic of high bleeding risk patients because um, we've traditionally, many interventions have felt that just extending the dual duration of dual antiplatelet therapy is going to be the protective way. But when you see this many patients potentially at high bleeding risk, I think we want to curtail the dual antiplatelet therapy, be doing that safely, but then also optimizing our stents. So maybe Roxana, you've led a large effort in this area. You're very involved with the um, ARC in terms of high bleeding risk. Tell us, you know, what your thoughts are right now, you know, for, you know, if you have a high bleeding risk patient, what should clinicians be doing both in the lab and out of the lab? It's obviously a long question, but maybe if you could focus it a little bit in terms of the take home for clinicians. So thank you for that question, Ajay. I, I think the first thing that we have to do uh, as, uh, as uh, clinicians is to actually look for high bleeding risk uh, and, and evaluate patients for high bleeding risk, which I think often uh, we do not. Uh, and, I, and I think now more than ever before, when you're seeing 40% of the labs, uh, and, and this is three different laboratories that uh, uh, Philippe Urban just showed, uh, up to 40% of patients would, would actually meet the criteria according to ARC-HBR. And then it's those patients where, and, and that probably means that on a daily basis, you're seeing uh, HBR patients and you have to make those important decisions. I think it, one of the biggest things is that these same patients have very, very high ischemic risk. And that's where the balance becomes extremely uh, difficult. And I think the trade-off and the paper that um, uh, Philippe Urban showed uh, actually does give you a really, really good um, insight into the difficult decisions that we clinicians have to make on a daily basis. At the end of the day, it really is a, a risk stratification and a good discussion with the patient and understanding those risks and benefits. Early after intervention, I think we still have to focus in that first month on the ischemic burden on the patients, especially in those who had complex lesions treated. Later on, uh, I think you can start to really think about those bleeding avoidance strategies and now one of them could be a P2Y12 monotherapy, which we didn't really discuss during this particular session. And I think it's something that we can think about. So it's not a, 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 a slam dunk answer. I'm sorry about that. Um, it actually makes us as clinicians think more, dive deeper into history uh, taking with our patients and understanding better and surveying these patients on a regular basis for uh, evaluating their ischemic and bleeding risk. I think that's a great answer. Maybe I'll first direct this to Stefan and then to Philip. So what are the next trials that need to be done? You both pioneered the, the trials this way. What needs to be done now? Because we can always do more. Well, um, I think we still don't know what uh, the optimal duration of dual antiplatelet therapy is. That is, uh, both in Leaders 3 and Onyx 1, there was a regime of one month uh, DAPT, uh, yet we don't know whether that is really the optimal uh, kind of uh, uh, duration. And uh, I think master DAPT is ongoing, probably will uh, shed some uh, light or provide uh, more information. I think uh, the second uh, complex uh, patient uh, population are those uh, that have atrial fibrillation and require oral anticoagulation. And they're uh, really, um, I think only the Augustus trial approaches somehow uh, the issue of, of uh, uh, 
the combination of dual antiplatelet therapy with uh, uh, NOACs, but still I think uh, there is residual uncertainty as to the safety of very early discontinuation of aspirin, uh, particularly uh, during the first uh, month. So I think we have made uh, great progress, um, but uh, as with all great studies, there are, there are probably more questions uh, that uh, resulted from them. And I think uh, the optimal DAPT in duration is uh, one of them. Question will be, can it be ever resolved or does it need to be individualized? Maybe we'll give Philip the last word before we close the session. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, with Stefan. Um, the trial that I'm personally waiting for, um, we don't have to design it, it's already enrolled, is must adapt, uh, because that's really going to look at HBR patients with either long or short DAPT. It'll tell us uh, a lot. I think we'll learn a lot from that trial. Uh, but then, yes, I agree also with Stefan that at the end of the day, probably we're going to have to go into a tailored uh, DAPT antithrombotic regimen, uh, and the level of complexity is just going to keep increasing from here. It's not going to get simple, uh, but it's continued to be interesting for sure. Well, I think that's a, a great point uh, to finish on, uh, Philip. And uh, I think uh, these topics are really of great interest and uh, we could have uh, discussed them in uh, more detail for much longer. But in the interest of time, I'll uh, thank my co-moderator, uh, Ajay, for, uh, for uh, uh, going through this session with me today. And I'll thank all of the discussants for their active uh, participation, all the speakers for really excellent and concise overviews and thank uh, Duk Wu and his uh, team for organizing this meeting and for asking us to be involved. And finally, I'll thank all of you for uh, watching online for your participation. Thank you. <laughs>